Hey guys, and welcome back. For today's video, we're going to take a look at the short life of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born Annelise Marie Frank on the June the 12th, 1929 in Frankfurt, Germany. She was born to parents Edith and Otto Heinrich Frank. She had one sibling, who was an older sister called Margot. Her parents were considered liberal Jews and believed on educating their children, encouraging them to read and write from an early age. In 1933, when Anne was just four years old, Adolf Hitler's Nazi party had won the federal election and things soon became increasingly dangerous for the Franks. So in 1934, they all had relocated to Amsterdam after their father had secured a job at Petka Works where he would later become the managing director. The girls adapted quickly to their new life in the Netherlands and began school. It was apparent early on that Margot had an aptitude for arithmetic with Anne showing hers in reading and writing. Her friend Hanalee Goslar would later recall that when they were kids, Anne was always writing, but always kept the content of her work closely guarded and would not show it to anyone. By May of 1938, Anne's father Otto opened up a second business, a wholesale company called Pectacon that sold herbs, salts and spices for uses in sausages. Then in May 1940, the Germans invaded the Netherlands and was met with little resistance. They installed a puppet government, which among other things was put into place to root out Jews. Almost overnight, they brought in restrictive and discriminatory laws and so began the persecution. Registration as a Jew was mandatory and eventually this led to segregation. Otto tried to flee to America with his family, but the visa application was never processed due to the closing of the US consulate in Rotterdam which, as you know, was heavily bombed. Segregation then spread to the school system and the girls were only allowed to attend school for Jews. So they were transferred to a school called the Jewish Lyceum to continue their education. By May 1941, Otto took action to save his companies from being confiscated and transferred his shares in Pectacon to their close family friend, Johannes Kleiman, who, as it turns out, would later help hide the family. After resigning as director, the company was then liquidated and its assets transferred to Gies & Company, which was run by Jan Gies, who also led a secret double life, as he was a member of the Dutch resistance. The same would be carried out with Otto's other company, Petka. For Anne's 13th birthday, on the 12th of June 1942, she received a small autograph book, which she would come to use as a diary. Then on July the 5th, the Franks received a call notice for Margot to attend the Central Office for Jewish Emigration for relocation to a work camp. Panicked by this news, the Frank family went into hiding the day after and hid at Apetka offices on the Prinzengracht, with it later becoming known as Akterhaus. They left their original residence in a mess and even left a note stating that they were bound for Switzerland in the hopes that this would throw authorities off the scent. The entrance to the annex they moved into was cleverly hidden by a large bookshelf. The living quarters were spread out over three floors, however living conditions were cramped for the family, especially when Herman and August van Pell came to stay along with their 16-year-old son Peter, and by November that year, Fritz Pfeffer. They were cared for by a few trusted employees of a Petka. They would bring them food and supplies, and even news of current political events bridging the gap between their self-imposed isolation and that of the outside world. Anne often wrote about her relationships with each member of the household, detailing the ups and downs she had with each of them. She would form perhaps the closest bond with one of the carers called Bet Boscule. They were often seen standing in corners and whispering together. Her relationship with her own mother was strained as she found that she could be cold-hearted towards her. But as time went on, Anne reflected on her own behaviour and realised she was as much to blame. She began to act more respectful towards her. Similarly, the situation with her sister Margot would also improve. Anne came to consider her as a real friend. Anne would spend most of her time reading and studying while keeping up with her narrative of daily events as they occurred. She even wrote that she aspired to become a journalist she was ambitious and wanted to be useful and bring happiness to the world through her writings. Her final diary entry was on the 1st of August 1944, 
as three days later, on the morning of August the 4th, German police, led by Karl Silberbauer, raided the Achter House and arrested all occupants, including Anne. They were taken to Reich Main Security Office and interrogated overnight until the following day when they were sent to a detention camp before being sent to Westerbork Transit Camp in the northern Dutch province of Drenthe, where they were sent to the punishment barracks to carry out hard labour. They would remain there before finally departing on September 3rd to the now infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. Of the 1,019 passengers that made the journey from Westerbork, 549, including all children younger than 15, were sent straight to the gas chambers upon arrival. This was done as they were deemed unfit for labour. Anne was considered lucky, as she had turned 15 only three months prior. The women were then separated from their father by the SS. They were each stripped naked, then shaved before being disinfected and each given an identifying number which was tattooed on their arm. Anne worked doing hard labour during the day, being forced to haul rocks and dig rolls of sod. At night they were sent to the barracks where conditions were overcrowded and disease ridden. It was not long before Anne and Margot developed scabies and were sent to the infirmary which turned out to be just as terrible a place as the barracks with rats and mice infesting every corner. Her mother Edith would give all her food rations that she received to her girls. The girls were then transported along with 8,000 other women to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, leaving their mother behind. Edith would later die of starvation. By the end of October 1944, Anne and Margot were briefly reunited with two friends Nanette Biltz and Hanali Goslar, who had both survived the war. Biltz would go on to mention that during the brief conversations they had with one another, that Anne thought that both her parents had died and said that if that was the case, that she did not want to go on living. Biltz described Anne's appearance as emaciated and that she was constantly shivering. At the beginning of 1945, an outbreak of typhoid spread through the camp killing up to 17,000 people. People were dying by the hundreds daily, with reports suggesting that it was up to 500 a day. By February, both Frank sisters were already showing signs of having contracted typhoid. Margot was so weak that she was bedridden and eventually fell from her bunk and died. Anne tragically succumbed only a few days later. Their deaths were never recorded, but heartbreakingly, it is believed to have been only a matter of weeks before the British liberated the camp on April the 15th, 1945. After the war, it was estimated that 5,000 of the 107,000 Jews that were sent to concentration camps from the Netherlands between 1942 and 1944 survived. Of the immediate family, only Frank Otto survived the war and returned to Amsterdam. It took him several weeks to learn the tragic truth about what had happened to his wife and daughters. Then, in July of 1945, Miep Gies returned some of Anne's belongings and among them was her little red diary. After reading the diary, he was blown away by the meticulous detail of her work and the accounts of daily life in occupied Amsterdam. He decided that the world should be made aware of these writings. A voice of a child that embodies all the hideousness of fascism, wrote the Dutch historian Jan Romain. The book would finally be published in 1947 under the name Het Achterhuis, or the Annex. It went on to be published in many languages and in many countries all over the world. Over the coming decades, Many attempts were made that questioned the book's authenticity, with Holocaust deniers stating that Otto himself had written the diary and not Anne, something that he fought hard to disprove. After his death in 1980, he willed the original diary and sheets to the Dutch Institute of War Documentation, which in 1986 commissioned a forensic study of the diary and additional documents 
to be carried out by the Netherlands Ministry of Dutch Justice. After many stringent tests, it was proved to be authentic and was declared so by a ruling in 1980 by the Hamburg Regional Court. This was a difficult subject to research and even more so to put into writing. While making this video, I can't help but think what would have happened had she survived. Would her accounts of life in occupied Netherlands ever have come to light? Would they have had such an impact on not only the literary world, but the world in general? The sad truth is we will never know. With that being said, I'll leave it there. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.